Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Well, it's time for our second hot topic, and this one is a book review. Now, in a world of marginalized community, gender issues, women, children, you know, just living like this, well, there are people who are still making a change and advocating for these causes. Now, joining me to have a conversation is BC Adeleye Fayemi. She's a feminist activist, a policy advocate, a social change philanthropy practitioner, a writer and the former first lady of Ikiti State. Good morning, Matt. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here. Lovely to have you. All right. So you have two new books coming, right? They are here now. One of them is Demand and Supply. Another is a tray of locust bins. Now, I've read, you know, the foreword of some of these books, and they really talk about, you know, change in our community. They talk about, you know, gender issues. They talk about um, marginalization of communities. So let's just ask, you know, what inspired you to write these books? Because for us to be in this, you know, we're living in Africa, and there are lots of things here that maybe might not just be so great, right? But then there are people who are trying to make a change and that's something you are doing with your book so I just want to get you know just tell us about the book and what inspired you to write these books thank you well demand and supply is the third volume of loud whispers in 2016 I launched my loud and my above whispers website and I started to write a weekly column known as loud whispers and since then, I've published volumes of essays, short stories, and poetry. We have Loud Whispers, the first volume, which came out in 2017. Um, Where is Your Rapper, which is volume two, that came out in 2020. And Demand and Supply came out recently, that's the third volume. It's a collection of essays, and as I said, short stories and poetry on a range of issues ranging from um, gender stereotypes, the uh, status of women in our communities, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, politics, religion, um, and so on. And the second book, A Tray of Locust Beans, is a collection of fiction, short stories, and poetry that I've written over the past 25 years. At a book reading I did um, three years ago, one of the young, writers there challenged me to pull all my um, fiction and poetry together into one publication to encourage younger writers. So that's what a tray of locust beans is. But they essentially cover the issues that you have mentioned, trying to look at society through the eyes of marginalized people, particularly women and girls. That's amazing because I, I know that these are, you know, complex issues and, you know, we need people to speak more about this and that's what advocacy is all about. Now, as the former first lady of Ekiti State, um, you were one of the trustees for Comic um, Relief UK. In fact, reading your bio, there was a lot and I'm just like, you've been able to do so much, which inspires other people and me as well. Now, I believe that you've been able to drive conversations about feminist activism, um, gender issues, and not just in your state, not just in Nigeria, but the world at large. Now, how do you think that your work through these books, you know, contributes to these issues and what perspectives or insights, um, what are you trying to bring to people who even don't know about this or who even don't, you know, are trying to push out these conversations and understand this narrative? So what new perspectives are you trying to bring with these books? I have worked in um, international development for over 35 years. And I've done this in many parts of the world. I lived and worked in England. I worked in um, Accra, Ghana, and I did a lot of work in many African countries when I was running the African Women's Leadership Institute and the African Women's Development Fund. And all this was before my husband, Dr. Okao Defayemi, became the governor of the state mm. in 2010. And so when my husband became God of the Kitty State, my thinking then was charity begins at home. That's right. All this I've done on raising issues of concern around women and trying to ensure that we have a society that is more equitable for both men and women. Let me try and do the same thing for women in my own community as well. 
And so that is why I spent a lot of my time in Ekiti State on policy advocacy issues, trying to get laws and policies in place, especially around sexual and gender-based violence and um, educational policies and getting women into leadership positions. When I write, I write to draw attention to things that we already know, but then it's important to point out that there's something that we can all do. I have had the privilege of um, being able to use different platforms over the years as a development practitioner, as a, um, as a donor when I was at the African Women's Development Fund, as um, a first lady when my husband um, was a governor, and as a writer, and in many other capacities as well as a leader in my community. And so I have always used these platforms to push these issues I'm talking about. So wherever we are, whether we are professional or policy makers or uh, simply parents, grandparents, uh, members of a community, there's always something we can do to ensure that we make lives better for everyone and that we stop the um, perpetuation of gender stereotypes and the attitudes and beliefs that continue to reinforce um, you know, the thinking that women are second-class citizens, and that is how they are treated throughout their life cycle. No society can achieve any of its development goals if it does not fully involve women in all the things that it does. So marginalizing women and depriving them of a voice and agency is going to, be, is going to make the society worse off for everyone. All right. So I know that in November 2011, you um, led a campaign to enact um, a law against gender-based violence, so gender-based prohibition law. Um, and you've done so many others, you know, after then. So because this is a way, this is an activism, if we can call it that. So speaking about activism, how do you see the political and social affairs impacting the life, the lives of women and marginalized community? And what role do you think, especially you being in the forefront in Ikiti State, what role do you think this activism and advocacy play in driving change? Well, the law you referred to uh, that was passed in Ikiti State in 2011, the Gender-Based Violence Prohibition Law, yes. that law was revived in October 2019. Yeah. Because in 2015, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law was passed um, at the federal level. And so states were obliged to domesticate what we know as the VAP law, in short. And so Ikiti State revised the um, 20. 11 law in 2019. Now, it's one thing to pass a law. It's another thing to ensure that the law is implemented. And I think this is where we need to pay close attention to the importance of political will. Mm. Our political leaders and um, policy makers, they usually say a lot of really good things around these issues, mm. around the need for women to be involved in... Um, you know, the communities or state development or national development. Um, a lot of guarantees are made and promises are made. But there's always a disconnect between the policy frameworks, the laws and the promises and the realities that women face in their communities. So I believe one of the things um, people like we try to do is to draw attention to the need for more political will. And political will can be determined through the amount of um, resources, human resources, material resources, technical or financial resources you apply to an issue. And apart from political will, it's also important for, as I said earlier, for people to make good use of the platforms they occupy. We have many people um, in positions of influence, um, including women, and it's important for us to see a critical mass of people pushing for change. It can't just be a handful of overworked women leaders in civil society organizations who have been doing a tremendous job. Mm. If, we need to, if we want to see scale, at, if we want to see change um, on a large scale, this needs to be done by everyone pulling their weight. And so it's important for our governments, our policymakers, to um, ensure that they have the right kind of partnership and the right and putting the right kind of effort 
to make life better for women in our communities. The statistics, uh, when it comes to different uh, indices around gender equality and women's empowerment, our figures in Nigeria are not encouraging at all. Mm -hmm. And this should be of concern to our leaders. We feature very low when it comes to women in uh, politics and decision making with less than 3% of women in the National Assembly. Nigeria has one of the highest rates of maternal mortality in the world. I think we are now number three. And we have one of the largest numbers of out-of-school children. In Nigeria, we have up to um, 16 million children who are out of school, and 60% of those are girls. And I could give you more um, of these figures. So we need to put in more effort at all level to ensure that um, we make this society fairer and safer for both um, men and women. And that starts from ensuring that we give um, girls and boys equal opportunities. Definitely, that's 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 totally right. Especially in a world where that it is progressive, and I know, like in the past, they would always say, you know, a male child. You know, if you get married and you don't have a male child, it's almost like, why do you have all girls? But now people are getting to see that, you know, women are breaking barriers, women are, you know, breaking boundaries, and then we can also have a seat at the table. And so, even circling back to what you said, um, talking about how we we can have all of these ideas and say this is what we want to do but the action is not really being put in place so if we're saying that we want more girls to go to school we definitely need to find a way to ensure that more girls are going to school if we're saying we want to save you know the women especially when they go to give birth and we don't want our women dying we definitely need to you know invest more in the healthcare system so how can the government you know go more about this is there some partnerships that we need to do as a nation that we're not doing what can you advise us to do we if we're saying that this is where we want to get to and how do we execute it to get there thank you so let us start with what we do have mm. because we are not starting from zero mm. we have a national gender policy in this country and that national gender policy was first put in place in, in the year 2005 and it was revised um, as recently as 2022 and what needs to uh, what was meant to happen was that states in the country um, ought to have domesticated this national gender policy as a roadmap for putting policies and programs in place for gender equality and women's empowerment the first state to domesticate the national gender policy in october 2011 was a kitty state since then, I believe no more than five states across the country, and that's been generous, have domesticated the national gender policy. This is extremely important. Again, two years ago, the Federal Minister of Women Affairs uh, launched a women's economic empowerment policy. And recently, I saw in the news that uh, commissioners for women affairs from across the country were brought together, asking them to make sure that this is domesticated in the various states. These tools are extremely important because it's for any state that applies themselves to the domestication and implementation of these um, documents, it shows a certain degree of seriousness and it shows that there's political will in ensuring that these issues are addressed. So beyond having all these policy frameworks on paper, it's also important to have the uh, right kind of resources to ensure that all these um, plans are put in place. And in my experience of working with machinists for gender, whether they are at national level or at state level, is that the um, national and state machinists for gender are usually the least resource in terms of financial resources and human resources. And this can't be because you can't expect um, a decent healthcare plan for women, a decent plan around education for girls, um, monitoring of um, gender um, plans in the different uh, ministries, departments, and uh, agencies to be done effectively if you don't have gender specialists, if you don't have people who know what they are doing. So we, so we need to pay attention to that. And there are a lot of women's rights organizations, a lot of civil society organizations working quietly in their communities 
across the country on a lot of the issues I've spoken about. They are mostly under-resourced, unacknowledged. A lot of them are not based in the large cities where they can attract donor funding. And so we need to ensure that they have the right kind of support and partnership. And donor agencies are doing the best they can. But it would also be good if um, local philanthropists can seek out those who are doing this work. Not everyone needs to set up a foundation of their own. There's someone somewhere running a food kitchen. There's someone somewhere running a shelter yeah. uh, for women and girls who need it. So we, can, we all have a role to play in ensuring that we provide um, safe spaces and support for the organizations who are doing this work. So back to what I was saying earlier, all of us have a role to play. We can't just leave it to the government alone. Mm. I love that. And I know that one role you are playing, aside being active in all of this work, you are writing about this. So circling back to your book, um, you know, what role do you think storytelling, you know, just helps in this whole advocacy thing? So storytelling is important because when you tell stories, you try to get people to see the world through the eyes of your characters. Mm. Get them to experience what they are feeling, what they are experiencing or what they are feeling. And so if you take one of my stories, which is about domestic violence and the tragic consequences, you get to um, understand what Poma's life um, was like and the context within which she lived her life and what resulted in the end. Or life through the eyes of Sharon, and what living with mental health means uh, for those um, you know, who are doing so. Yeah. Or the consequences of the sexual exploitation of minors, which is um, the story of Mabel in a tree of locust beans. So storytelling enables me to um, bear witness to certain things I've heard, um, stories I'm, uh, I'm life experiences I'm familiar with, and also not just to teach, but also to learn as well. Because as you write, you learn about the world that you live in because you also need to then pay attention to the context in which you are telling these stories as well. It's amazing. And, um, we, all and we all tell stories. We love telling stories. Yes. And so one way to learn and let people understand the message, get, pe get people to understand the message you are putting across is to tell a story as coherently as you can. That's right. Now, in Demand and Supply, you highlighted relationships and intergenerational concerns. So what do you think is the most critical aspect of inter intergenerational relationships and how can we start to nurture them, especially in this day and age that we are in? I think it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing, but I think the, one of the most important things is, the first of all, Acknowledge the tension and not pretend that they don't exist. Mm. Younger people are fond of uh, telling older people to get out of the way and to shut up. Mm. And, um, you know, their lives are different and, you know, they will do things their own way. Uh, your time has passed and let's do things their own way. And older people are fond of telling young people that they don't know anything and that they're always making mistakes. And, um, you know, they don't know their left from their right. I don't think any of these approaches is helpful. I have learned that it's important to have an intergenerational approach to things. Younger people can learn from older people, and older people can learn from younger people too. It's a two-way process. Mm. And that way, we understand the different roles we're able to play. There are lots of things that young people do that older people can't, at least not anymore. Mm -hmm. And then there are things that older people can do that younger people can't. So it's a way, I think it's just about figuring out what strengths we all have and leveraging on those strengths towards a common purpose, as opposed to, um, you know, wasting our energies and our time on accusing, um, you know, each other of, about who occupies what space. Mm 
I agree with you totally because one thing, a joke we like to make is older people are not very tech savvy. So leave it for the younger ones, right? And they can teach you, they can just give you more information on that. And then the older people have more experience. So at the end of the day, let's just know where we fall into and we work, work together, you know, just to have a better life, really, or a better generation. Um, so let me move over to a tray of locust bins. Now, that is an anthology of previously published short stories and poems by you and it is said to be one that would make you laugh cry and you know laugh again but can you just tell us the importance of this book considering the multiple um perspectives and experiences and i mean you've spoken about some of the some of the um people in these books as well but can you just tell us the the importance of it really well a tray of locust beans as I said earlier, it's an anthology that pulls together work I've done over a period of time. And when I was putting it together, I went through all kinds of emotions because the writing of the poetry of the short stories were a reflection of uh, my mood at the time I was writing them. Um, sometimes um, I write um, when... I feel hopeful or upbeat. And sometimes I write when I'm angry and frustrated and just want to vent. Aww. And being able to have all these um, different emotions play out in the writing was something that meant a lot to me. And I hope that those who get to read the book will, uh, you know, will find something in it for them as well. And it enabled me... Um, talk about a lot of very difficult issues, mm. uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, people usually don't want to talk about. Um, sexual violence, um, sexual, explo ex sexual exploitation, um, harmful traditional practices, um, how important it is for women to um, learn resilience from a very early age. So these um, stories are all woven uh, in such a way that will enable us to think of how these characters play out in our own lives. We all know someone from these stories. We all know a Mabel, a Sharon, a Temi. And we need to ask ourselves, these characters that I've seen played out in these stories, or this poem I've just read, if they come my way, what would be my reaction to them? Would I be able to support them in the way they need support so that they can have a different result? Um, the outcome can be different or the outcome can be the same depending on what the story is. So basically, it's just meant for people to reflect and take away, you know, what, would, what resonates with them and then uh, take action on it. That's right. Taking action is always important because at the end of the day, it's not just about where you are. If you're saying you want to be a better person, you need to take action um, to get you there. So let's come to you as a person, because I'm always interested in the person behind, you know, all of this successful work that they've done. Um, you are a successful writer. You've, you're the author of Loud Whispers, Where's Your Rapper, you know, and a lot. And now we have two books, Demand and Supply, A Tree of Locust Bins, that are also going to follow in that trajectory so here is my question to you what is your favorite part of being a writer aside the fact that you said even when you're angry or you want to vent you use that you know just to help yourself but what's your favorite part of being a writer I, it's hard to say what's a favorite part to be but i think the fact that i'm able to express myself yeah and when you are like me, um, middle-aged, I turned 60 last year, and I was so hyped about turning 60. I let every and anyone around me know I am 60. And people say, yeah, 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 like, yeah, I am 60. For me, it was extremely important because I keep saying to myself, there are some things I know for sure, as a provincial used to say. There are some experiences I've gone through. There are some things I've um, borne witness to. And I believe I've earned the right to be able to talk about them, to be able to process them and reflect on them. And when, and when I write, I don't necessarily um, want people to think that what I'm saying is the gospel truth and they take it or leave it. 
I'm just saying this is my experience. This is uh, how I see things. This is my opinion. And then you make what you want um, out of that. So for, for me, that's one of the greatest things about being a writer, being able to just say what's on your mind. And as I said, at a certain age, you are not afraid of, you know, what someone, oh, I write this. Maybe uh, it's, like a lot of young people come to me and say, if I write, if, um, I'm afraid if I say something, people might think I'm too feminist and they tell me it might scare away men. And I look at them like, why would you want to um, censor yourself because of what someone would say? But then you also have to understand the context different people are coming from. I don't have any of that baggage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I have to be reckless with mm -hmm. the things I say or the things I write. But I think I've earned the right to be able to say things as they are and um, process things using um, the layered um, and nuanced lenses mm. that I have learned to um, adapt over time. That's amazing. So, and that gives me joy. Yeah, there's nothing like expressing yourself, especially when you're coming from a place of honesty. So regardless of, you know, whatever other people would say, you hope they understand you, but then you're just putting yourself out there. And I think that is amazing. And so which leads to, you know, this book, Demand and Supply, A Tree of Look Husbands. I know that these are to address um, gender and societal issues. And so I'm just asking what, what hope, you know, what do you want the readers to take away from this book? And how do you envision it to... Um, spark conversations and not just even spark conversations drive action because that is what it should be about not just talking about it but doing something about it I when people read my work I expect people to first of all think about how it applies to them and what experiences and um, they might have gone through that are similar or someone close to them a lot of the work I have written has been inspired by um, experiences I've seen of people around me growing up and then uh, through uh, my work in my different uh, capacities and platforms around the world. So people should think about, you know, what um, resonates with them in what I've written. And then for people who occupy certain positions or have certain platforms, um, as I mentioned earlier, mm. Then you can say, okay, if I'm a teacher, how can I teach differently mm. so that um, I can uh, minimize the gender, gender stereotypes that perpetrate discrimination against women and girls? Mm. If you are a parent, how can I bring up my daughters differently? And how can I bring up my sons differently? If I'm a father, what kind of a relationship should I be having with my daughter? Should I be bringing up my daughter to believe that she's nothing She'll be uh, good for nothing other than uh, just, you know, end up in some other man's house and let me just do the barest feeding mom for her. Or am I raising her to be uh, the queen um, that mm. I believe she's going, uh, she's capable of being and letting her know that she's capable of being, um, you know, the best in the world that she wants to be. That's the um, message I got from my father. And for policy makers and um, those who are in position to make laws, make decisions that affect the lives of billions. What can you do to make sure that change happens at a large scale? Revise the policy, review a policy, change the law, and so on. Every day there are things happening around us, and there's always someone, or there are always a group of people who can say, no, this stops at my doorstep, or I'm going to talk to other people and make sure that this does not happen. And an example um, that you will find in demand and supply is a story of how I worked with... Um, other colleagues at the time, other first, state first ladies, to put pressure on the Nigerian Governors Forum. At the time, my husband was chairman of the Governors Forum, and I was responsible for coordinating um, uh, state first ladies. And so we put pressure on the Nigerian Governors Forum to declare a state of emergency against sexual and gender-based violence. And this was done on June 12, 2020. And because of that step we took, out of um, only 13 states that had passed the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law in June 2022, today 35 states in Nigeria have the decision against um, sexual and gender-based violence. The only state in Nigeria that does not have a GBV law is Kano State. And that is because some of us used the platform that we occupied at that time to, to mobilize others and make sure that change happens. So... 
I would like to believe that we are all capable of doing that. And as we do so, also remember that this is not to do with the sources because I'm sure people will be thinking, oh, well, of course you have resources to be able to give to people. That's how you can help people. Helping people is, is not only to do with how much money you have. It's to do with how large your heart is, not how large your wallet is. So even if it's just a prayer or a shoulder to cry on, there is something you can do to support the next person. And that's invoking um, the message in one of my publications, where is your rapper? We all have a rapper, male and female. Let us bring our rappers out for other people. That's so sweet. Like, in fact, it makes me emotional hearing you speak, especially when you said raising your child, your female child as the queen that she is. And that's what we want in our society. We want women to feel they're enough and they're not less than really. Anyways, as we wrap it up, my next question is what is next? So are there like any new projects, initiatives, anything that you're working on and, you know, how we can also support as well? Well, what I'm working on, um, there are two things. Um, I have the uh, rapper network that um, is a mentoring um, and support platform for young women. And it came out of um, the work I was doing around where's your rapper. And a lot of people, um, you know, really liked uh, the metaphor. So I did, and young people keep coming to me and asking, can you be my mentor? And you can't mentor thousands of young people one-on-one. -on -one. So I set up uh, this um, online mentoring platform. So we have the Rapper Network. So my intention now is to do a lot more work with the Rapper Network and to and I've been running a Rapper Fund, which um, provides support for young women who want to start um, an enterprise but don't qualify for a bank loan. Yeah. So to get them to a point where they, they can then, you know, start something and then, you know, hopefully be able to apply for a loan and take it from there. So I'm working on that. And then, of course, I'm working on another book. And uh, this time that's in collaboration with uh, the Africa Leadership Center at King's College London, where I'm a visiting senior research fellow. And it's on my leadership journey, looking at uh, feminist leadership and social transformation in, on the African continent. Amazing. In fact, you're doing such good, good work. And I would personally tell you that I am, I am so inspired. I can't even say I'm proud of you. So I would say I'm inspired by you. I wish I could give you a hug from here, but it was lovely having Thank a conversation you. with you and well done. I wish you all the best um, in all the endeavors, anything that you put your hands to. Thank you so much for having a conversation with me this morning. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for inviting me. I enjoyed being here. Yes, we'll speak again Thank soon. <laughs> okay. All Bye. right. Bye. All right, we've been speaking with BC Adele Fayemi. She's a feminist activist, a policy advocate, a social change philanthropy practitioner, a writer, and the former first lady of Ekiti State. And we've just been reviewing her book. Um, one of them is Demand and Supply. The other is A Tray of Locust Bins, and they address societal and gender-based issues. Anyways, that's where we have to wrap it up on the breakfast today. It was lovely having a breakfast with you. My name is Rome Paulson. I'll see you again on Monday. Have an amazing weekend.